How about the werewolf? Are werewolves real? Now, this might, you know, bake your noodle a little, but yes, they are real. Though the underdog, pardon the pun, in the monster hierarchy, there is actually more evidence for werewolves existing exactly as they are seen in Hollywood movies. Think about that. That there's technical terms for these. They're either a lycanthrope or a theriomorph. See, I gotta, I gotta show off here a little. I, and I have a college degree. <coughs> uh, lycanthrope comes from two words. Lucan in Greek means wolf, and anthrope means man. A theriomorph is a broader term. Therios is the Greek word for beast. Like if you were to read um, in the book of Revelations, in the Greek, it would be to mega therion, the great beast. Uh, and morph, of course, we all know that means to change. So a theriomorph is someone who can change into a beast of whatever sort, because it ain't just werewolves. It can be, you know, where, whatever. But, but werewolves are the most popular because of the savage intellectual cunning of the species Canis lupus. I don't know if any of you have any kind of intimate knowledge of wolves, but they're amazing creatures. They are amazing creatures. They're extremely smart, extremely powerful. And um, their nose... Believe it or not, a typical wolf's nose is a hundred times better than the best bloodhound. They can like, they could find one person in the city of New York, just like that. So, anyway, this goes way back to the dawn of human history. You can, in fact, um, go into caves in Europe and other places and you'll find drawings that go back to before the bud of time of men with wolf's heads, men with antlers, men with various other animal appurtenances. And some of this is rooted in the idea of shamanism. I don't know if you've heard of the word shaman. It's very trendy right now if you're into the New Age movement. Uh, but shamans are what we used to call witch doctors. And you, I'm sure you've all seen movies of like Native Americans and they're wearing like buffalo heads or, or like, I don't know, when I lived in Seattle and Pacific Northwest, you would see Native American dances and they'd wear like a, a raven head or even a head that represented a, a killer whale or, or something like that. Well, there's this idea that by wearing these things, you assume the character and the power and the nobility of the animal. And if you talk to these shamans, they will say, oh yeah, we can actually turn into a killer whale. We can turn into a wolf. We can turn into a raven. And you might say, yeah, right, that's just, you know, the old engine Joe has been drinking too much fire water. You know, well, no, it's not quite that simple. Because, see, I'll tell you a true story. Uh, an old friend of mine, Dr. Chuck Swigert, no relation to Jimmy Swigert, spelled differently, he's a pediatrician, spirit-filled man, and um, he was working, doing pro bono work on a Native American reservation in the Pacific Northwest. He'd go there every week and look at the kids, you know, give them checkups, whatnot, take care of their illnesses. And every day, every week rather, he'd drive out at the end of the day and there'd be this old, wizened up Indian woman wrapped in a blanket. And she'd just be glowering at him. I mean, like, you know, if looks could kill, he would have been dead. And his car would have died. She's just glowering at him. He's like, whatever. You know, so week after week, this would happen. And then one day he was driving out of the, and this, again, this is a guy, I mean, he's a doctor, this isn't a flake. And he's driving out, and this lady's standing there, and he, he said, literally, in the blink of an eye, one minute she was there, like that, there was this giant raven standing there. And she was gone. That fast. And then the raven flew away. Now, that's called a skinwalker. That's what Native Americans call it. They can turn into wolves, they can turn into coyotes, they can turn into various other animals. So um, this stuff is very real. Um, let's see, in ancient Egypt, and again, we're talking 3,000 years ago, 
we see all these portrayals of beings. And I'm sure, again, you've seen these on TV with hawk heads, with crocodile heads, with uh, jackal heads, like Anubis is a jackal-headed god, the falcon-headed god Horus. What's this stuff talking about? Where is this coming from? Some of you may have heard of Petronius. He was a Greek author, contemporary of St. Paul's. And um, basically, uh, he talked about werewolves in his novel, the uh, Satyricon. And he is the first guy to associate them with the full moon. I'm sure most of you have heard the, the part of the legend that says, you know, and this is from the werewolf film with Lon Chaney Jr., even a boy who is good and says his prayers at night can become a werewolf when the moon turns bright. That's Maria Uspenskaya, the old gypsy. And that isn't really true. The moon, you see, has a long association with evil. And why do you think that is? Just real quickly, I'll share this. It has nothing to do with werewolves. The moon is a symbol of the church. Look at some of the references in the, uh, in, the, in the Bible about the moon. Think about it. The moon has no light of its own. It gets its light from what? The sun. Christ is the son of righteousness. And the moon is imperfect. It has a pockmarked face. That's why we all, oh, there's the man in the moon, you know. Just like the church is an imperfect image of the son, of the, of the son of God. Also, what happens when you have, when the, when you have a, let me think, a lunar eclipse? The moon goes dark. Why? Because the world gets between the moon and the sun. Just like a Christian goes dark when the world gets between Christ and the Christian. Just a little mini teaching there. Anyway. Um, so that isn't really based in anything. The idea that werewolves can actually turn into a uh, werewolf anytime they want. Uh, the term itself comes from the Old English weir, which means man, and wolf, which obviously means wolf. Uh, during the Middle Ages, there were many widespread outbreaks of werewolf attacks. And some of this, many people believe, relates to what we today call rabies. That, that someone would be bitten by a, a rabid animal, maybe even a wolf or a dog. And, you know, back then, again, these are primitive times, they'd go be, you know, frothing at the mouth and crazy and, you know, whatnot. And, and they, oh, it's a werewolf, you know. So some of this may very well have been, you know, uh, superstition or whatever. Now, werewolves are larger and stronger than either humans or wolves. So they're like the, the best and the worst of both species come together. And um, according to legend, they lose most of their humanity when they turn and develop a ravenous appetite for flesh. Um, though commonly thought today that you become a world by being bitten by one, this is actually a relatively modern idea. Um, there is actually, believe it or not, a medical condition known as clinical lycanthropy. There are people locked up in mental hospitals today that believe they are wolves. They walk around on all fours. They, they defecate like animals. Uh, they growl. They howl at the moon. And there's also another condition that's called hyperhirsutism. That's a big word. It means basically super hairy. And these are people, usually men, <laughs> thank goodness, that are really, really, really hairy. I mean, you know, like beyond hairy. And some people think that this might also have been some of the werewolf thing, because these guys look like apes. They're so hairy. Um, so anyhow, that is some of the origins of these things. Then you have in literature, now this is much pottier. There aren't as many novels and things about the werewolf as there are about um, the vampire. Herodotus wrote about a tribe called the Nerui, and this is 400 B.C., that they turn into wolves every nine years. Ovid talked of men who roamed the woods of Arcadia transforming into wolves in his book Metamorphosis. Interesting name, Metamorphosis. And I already mentioned Petronius' Satyricon, um, but they haven't gotten a lot of press compared to the vampire. When we look at werewolves in films, 
it's a little bit punier than the uh, the vampire cinema. Uh, and that is interesting. You may not know this, but there are the only figure in literature or film who has had more stuff made about him than Dracula is Sherlock Holmes. He's the most popular literary character in history. Dracula is number two. Werewolves are somewhere further down. But the very first werewolf film was Werewolf of London in 1935. Then the famous, the most famous one was The Wolfman with Lon Chaney Jr. That was in 1941. And then there were a few not so notable ones. But then there were the Howling films in 1981 and the sequels. And it's interesting to note that in the Howling film, the original one, that's the first time they ever really showed what a werewolf actually looks like. Because prior to that, like if you see The Wolfman with Lon Chaney, it's a very anthropomorphic wolf. In other words, it basically looks like a guy with a furry mask on. It isn't very impressive, although back then they were very scared by it because, you know, they were much more innocent in the 1940s. They'd only seen Hitler. But nowadays, the werewolves look a lot more real. They look a lot more like werewolves really look. And um, some of you may have heard this story, but, but I was told by colleagues in the Brotherhood of Satan that when you see the transformation in the movie The Howling, which is sort of like about two-thirds, three-fourths of the way through the movie, of this one character who actually turns into a werewolf on camera, that it's actually a real guy turning into a werewolf because they couldn't get the makeup ready in time. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it, it's interesting because if you, if you watch that film, it will give you an idea of what werewolves really look like because they are extremely scary, unless, of course, you have the blood of the lamb on your side. Um, let's see. Then in the same year, it was also an American werewolf in London. Uh, probably the, the most big screen actor type character ever play a werewolf is Jack Nicholson, who is arguably a huge Hollywood star. He starred in 1994 with Michelle Pfeiffer in the movie Wolf. And the Harry Potter films, which are of course very popular, uh, a werewolf figures prominently as a hero in the Harry Potter books and films. Then in, uh, after the turn of the millennium, we have the Underworld trilogy, as so far there's been three of them which is about a supposed war between werewolves and vampires. That's the the storyline is that werewolves are supposed to serve vampires, but they rebelled. That's actually total nonsense in reality, but, you know, that's another story. Uh, then the Twilight Saga, which is about, we've discussed it before in this talk, uh, this, this teenage love affair between a human teenage girl named Bella and a hundred-and-some-year-old vampire boy named Edward Cullen. There's also werewolves in that. In fact, it's interesting. Uh, if you go into Burger King, for example, which I don't recommend, but if you do, to eat lunch, you'll find they have placemats and they offer these gift cards where you can have Team Jacob or Team Bella or Team Edward, all relating to this, these movies. And Jacob is a Native American werewolf. And Edward is the vampire and Bella is the human girl. And so there's all these teenage girls out there that are rooting for Edward, and there's all these other teenage girls out there rooting for the hunky Native American werewolf. And, you know, in the movies and in the books, these Twilight, but the, the werewolves are portrayed as just human beings that just sort of, you know, through Hollywood special effects into this enormous wolf that's bigger than a Kodiak bear, you know. So that's not really accurate either. But again, we have a werewolf for the first time as a hero as a sympathetic character. And if you, I, I actually sat down and read all four of the Twilight novels, and um, he ends up being quite a hero. In fact, all the werewolves become heroes in the, in the, <clears throat> the Twilight books. So then, of course, very I think within a month or two, they're coming out with um, a remake of The Wolfman starring, again, big star Anthony Hopkins, who <laughs> also played Hannibal Lecter, and then as the werewolf, Benicio del Toro. So... Anyhow, in reality, I'll tell you, this picture, I'm going back one here, looks very much like a real werewolf. And I've seen a real werewolf. They are very imposing. Um, only high-level Satanists are gifted with this anointing. Uh, you, you can't, it's not like in the movies where if you are bitten by a werewolf, you become a werewolf. It's not that simple at all. In fact, 
you don't want to know how you become a werewolf. It's not fit for innocent ears, but it's, it's so horrifying and depraved, I don't even want to go into it. But you see, in the brotherhood, there are 10 degrees. Like, you know, first degree, second degree, third degree. These are grades of achievement. And when you get up to seventh degree, you become what is called an adeptus exemptus, which means you're an adept, I mean, someone who's very good at doing something, and exempt means you're beyond morality. You're exempt from good and evil at that point. You become a embryonic god in human form. <clears throat> at this point, there is a fork you have to take in the road in this particular flavor of Satanism that I was in. One way is to become a vampire, one way is to become a werewolf. I chose the way to become a vampire because I thought it was sexier somehow, and I'd heard that becoming a werewolf was extremely painful. And indeed it is. You can hear the bones crack. So I decided it would be less painful to be a vampire. Uh, anyway, true werewolves function as guards or assassins for the Brotherhood. Uh, a real werewolf is between 7 and 8 feet tall, weighs somewhere between three or 400 pounds, and uh, they're extremely formidable. Uh, I'm going to tell you several true stories about werewolves. Um, the first one was when we were out in Seattle in ministry, uh, a child was brought to us for ministry. And uh, he'd really been through something. <clears throat> See, Satanists love to do their rituals outdoors at night if they possibly can. And they love doing them in places of corruption, in places of evil fetid smells. So they love dumps. They love landfills. And there was a particular place where they had these, um, these methane flames coming up, you know, from the gases of the stuff decomposing on a very, very hellish place, both the flames at night and, of course, the stench. And so these two kids, one of whom we were, had sitting in front of us, were bicycling around after dark in this landfill, which wasn't a real smart thing to be doing, but you know how kids are. And anyway, they came upon this circle, and there were these people in black robes, and they were sacrificing something. They couldn't tell what it was, which was probably just as well. And they totally freaked. We got, you know, black robes, flames, the whole bit. It was obviously something they'd seen enough TV and, oh, this is something Satan, satanic, you know. And so they both hightailed it. They had those little bikes that kids, I don't know if they still have them or not, but with the banana seats and all that. And all of a sudden, this kid said they heard something like, boom, 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 coming behind them. And he looked around and there was, all he could see was this giant shape that was just towering over them with red, glaring eyes and it was the strides this thing were taking was taking were enormous and this kid was in the lead and his friend was behind him and it was boom boom and it, you know the, the ground was literally shaking under this thing and all of a sudden he heard his little friend go, ah! like that you know and he looked back and his friend wasn't there anymore and this thing was still coming you know boom 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 and the kid said that this giant hand five-fingered hand with talons on it that just wouldn't quit, came around and grabbed him by the chest. And he says, Oh, Jesus! <laughs> just like that, the thing like he was scalded, this giant whatever it was, let go, fell back like someone had kicked him in the teeth. And the kid pedaled home like the devil was after him, as you might imagine. His parents took him to the ER. He had to have like 30-some stitches. There was these marks like here here, here, and here on his little chest. He was like, I'd say 10 or 12 years old, I forget for sure. And, of course, the police went up there. They found nothing. But, you know, <laughs> that's what you expect because these, these folks are really good at cleaning up what they do. The other kid was never found, and he was probably lunch for that thing. And that's an example, one of the ways that they can, um, they can function as watchdogs, so to speak, for the brotherhood, when, when they're having a ritual or do something else <clears throat> important or sensitive, they're keeping a lookout because they have enormously good senses of smell. The other thing is that they're assassins. They can kill somebody and, you know, oh, it's a wild animal attack. 
because that's what it looks like. It looks like someone was mauled by a grizzly bear because they can literally rip the head off somebody as easy as you would pull apart a wishbone. Um, the other thing that happened was we had a lady come to us for ministry, sweet little woman. Her husband was, or ex-husband, I should say, was a Mormon bishop who lived right up the mountain from where we lived. <laughs> this is so funny. He lived on Cougar Mountain. And um, this is near Issaquah, which is a suburb of Seattle. And um, she told us that she felt she needed deliverance. And she was a Christian. And I said, well, why is that? And she says, well, for one thing, my ex-husband's a Mormon. But for another thing, the last time we had sex, it, he had dragged me down the stairs by my feet to the basement of our home, pushed a door, a button, and a secret part of the basin opened up. There was this satanic altar in there. There were all these people in there. He threw on the altar. They tied her up. And he turned right before her eyes into a werewolf. Ripped. He was. By the way, he, this guy was an airline pilot by profession. So just think, next time you're flying, your pilot might be a werewolf. <laughs> anyway, and he proceeded to rape her as a werewolf, and she had the scars to prove it. And uh, she felt that because of something that profoundly evil, she needed deliverance more so than just from being married to some typical Mormon guy. And so, and she lived in mortal fear of this guy. In fact, she wouldn't come. We were working out of Saints Alive Ministry at that time, Saints Alive in Jesus, and at that time it had a, a little parsonage right at the foot of this Cougar Mountain, and she wouldn't even come that near. We had to go to a church in Redmond, Washington, which is like probably 10, 15 miles from there, in order to minister to her. She wouldn't get that because she was so terrified of this ex-husband, and I could see why. Now, this happened to uh, my dear wife and um, her sister. We just moved to this very same place in 1987. And I was going to become a full-time minister with this. It was an evangelistic organization to witness to Mormons. And um, I had gone to a conference in uh, Utah to speak. And uh, so my wife and her sister were there. <laughs> and we were only in that building a couple of months, and they hadn't even bothered to put a lock on the door. Because it was out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it was like out in the country, you know. So there was no lock. And we were living in this split-level house. And down below us was another guy that worked in the ministry. And so all of a sudden, the first night I was gone, naturally I was gone, <clears throat> they heard this boom, boom, boom outside. And they started praying, you know, what's going on, you know. And, and my wife ran down the stairs to lock, and the door wouldn't lock. And so they did the thing like you see in the movies, they rammed a chair into the door, you know, just to try and keep it shut. And they looked out the living room window, and there it was, looking at them back. And this is from a second-story window. And it was, it was a werewolf, just like you saw in that picture. It was like, you know, seven or eight feet tall, big, looks like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger with steroids and fur, and uh, just... And the growl shook the house. And they were praying, and they were pleading the blood. This thing could not cross the blood. It could not, even though the house was totally defenseless in the natural, it could not cross the blood of the lamb. It could not get in that house. And it was so, it was you know, pacing back like a caged animal, you know, which was good because we got footprints. <laughs> and it was, the foot was this big. And there was like three balls here the size of softballs, one ball here, just like a super elongated wolf print. And people have asked me, well, do you think that's what Bigfoot is? No, Bigfoot's something else. But uh, I think maybe sometimes that when if these things are sighted in the woods or whatever, it might be mistaken for a Bigfoot because they're about the same size. But... As I and I'm not an authority on Bigfoot like I am about werewolves and vampires. But as I understand it, Bigfoot basically they have five toes, just like an ape or a human being, but they're just enormous. And um, anyhow, it was taken to the vet to figure out what the heck was. We took plaster of Paris. Is that it? Footprint casts of it. He said whatever this thing was, it was well over 350 pounds, and its stride, he said, indicated it was eight feet tall. 
And he said, I've never seen anything like this ever, ever, ever. And the funny thing was is this happened before we had the thing happen with a little lady who had the werewolf airline pilot husband. <laughs> and we wondered if maybe that was him checking us out because, of course, you know, he was a Mormon. Devout, he was a bishop in the Mormon church. And maybe he was sent down to do us in. Because, I mean, at that time, Ed Decker, who was running that ministry, was like regarded as the leading anti-Mormon in the world. I mean, he was like, they thought of him as the Antichrist, you know. So anyhow, um, so this stuff is real. I'm not saying that there's, you know, werewolves on every street corner. No, I'm not. But I am saying that they are wherever they are needed by the Brotherhood for whatever reason. And again, don't let Hollywood fool you. They're, um, they aren't just confined to the no moon, new moon. They can turn any time they want to turn. Although normally they will never do it in daylight because there's too much danger of being seen. Uh, but one thing about Hollywood is true. They fear silver. Now you might ask, why silver? Well, first of all, on a chemical level, silver is an antibacteriological agent. And some of you may take colloidal silver as a health uh, remedy. But beyond that, silver in the Bible is a symbol of redemption. You know, Yeshua was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And I don't know if you know this, but the tabernacle was built on silver. The foundation of the tabernacle was all made out of silver fittings. I mean, the boards were whatever, acacia, whatever, whatever it was, but the fittings are all silver. And so the idea is, is that silver is a symbol of the redemption of Christ. And so naturally, something that profoundly evil would, because believe me, you have to be, like, have more demons per cubic centimeter than, than in the entire city of San Francisco to be a werewolf or a vampire. You've got to be pretty bad off because the amount of demonic power it takes to make those transformations. And you might say, well, this, this just sounds too bizarre. Well, you don't, you don't know the power of the devil, number one. And you don't even know the power of the human body, number two. And I'll just illustrate with a couple of things here. Number one, and remember, when I, when I, when I am quote-unquote glorifying the devil, remember, compared to the Lord, he's a punk. He is like a gnat next to the Almighty God. So I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to glorify the devil, but I just want you to understand that, that there are amazing things that can be done. Um, we had a, um, a lady that I was working with in a secular setting. I was working as a drug counselor, and she was a drug addict and also a gambling addict, profound mental health issues. And she would have to be admitted almost every week to the mental ward at our local hospital. And they would have to put her in restraints, either a straight jacket or whatever. And when she was in restraints, she would have huge gashes appear on her back. Huge, enormous gashes. When she was totally like, you know, leather straps, arms and feet. I mean, the, her bed was soaked with blood. There's no explanation for that in the natural realm. We did a deliverance on her, and that didn't even help. That's what's called in psychology big word, sorry, somatization. See, this poor woman, when she was a child, anytime she did anything wrong, her parents would tie her up backwards to her little rocking chair in the nude and whip her with uh, rubber hoses. And that's just unspeakably horrible, but she carried that with her, and whenever she felt the least bit guilty, that's how it would manifest. And that's just the power of the human mind. When we used to be into witchcraft, my wife and I were both master hypnotists. And we could take somebody, hypnotize them, and we could take a pencil and say, this is a red-hot poker, touch it to their hand and raise a third-degree burn on their hand, just like that. See, that's the power of the mind. Now, bring in the power of the demonic. And, you know... Like, how do you account for this thing where this, this very prestigious doctor saw a woman standing there one second and the next second a raven that was one-tenth of her size? I mean, that's, that's pure satanic power. So, so don't immediately discount this stuff, especially when it's in the Bible. 
Okay. Uh, you go to Daniel chapter 4. Some of you already know what I'm talking about, perhaps. In Daniel chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, it's talking about a watcher and a holy one. It says, He cried aloud, and this is about in the book of Nezer, and he said thus, Hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave a stump in the roots, in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion, meaning the king, uh, be with the beasts of the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's, and let a beast's heart be given to him. And let seven times pass over him. Now later on, the king does not repent. That was a dream that Daniel interpreted for him. So he doesn't, he, his heart is still lifted up, and he is glorifying and boasting. And so in verse 33 of the same passage, it says, The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon the book of Nezer. He was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his belly was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. Now, what the heck is that? I'm not saying it's necessarily a werewolf. But it is definite. It says that he was given the heart of a beast, and it says that his nails grew like the talons of a bird, and his. It sounds like he turned into a, a were bird. <laughs> now that sounds kind of weird, but hey, the guy that initiated me and made me a Gnostic Catholic bishop was a were tarantula. So why not a were bird? Now, nobody knows for sure what that's all about, that passage. That's one of those passages that you have to, you know, kind of say, okay, Lord, that's something you're going to have to explain to me when I get up to glory. But I would submit to you that, that and it's interesting because some, one of the ways that someone can become a werewolf in folklore is if they blaspheme God. In medieval Europe, it was believed that if someone blasphemed the Lord, that that was that they would be smitten by him with the curse of becoming a lycanthrope. So, maybe that's what happened here. I don't know. But I would just say to you, there's enough room here for interpretation to not just totally shut your mind out to this. Um, and remember, the consummate satanic virtue is pride. Now, there's a phenomenon within Satanism that's called atavistic resurgence. Now, what does that mean? Well, an atavism is a throwback. If, like, you were overnight turning into a caveman or a cavewoman, that would be an atavism. This is considered a good thing in Satanism. There was a Satanist in the early part of the last century called Austin Osmond Spare, and he came up with a doctrine of atavistic resurgence which is you should try and reclaim the beast part of yourself. You should try and become a beast. You should literally try and transform yourself into a beast. And who would make these elaborate artistic talismans? This guy is uber creepy. I mean, this guy makes Aleister Crowley look like a Sunday school teacher. And, uh, and he was the originator of this doctrine. Now, in 1966, a key year, that was the year that Anton Zandor LaVey founded the Church of Satan. And one of the first things he did was uh, resurrect this doctrine of atavistic resurgence. In the Satanic Bible, which he wrote, one of the more evil books you'll ever read, he says that man is a beast, no better and often worse than the four-footed variety. And so therefore, we should embrace our beastliness. We should become gentlemen and lady beasts. And in fact, you can, you can actually see pictures. He, he, he designed satanic rituals where people would, would actually put on the head of a, like a plaster mache head of a pig or a head of a wolf or a head of a crocodile or whatever. And they would, they would actually crawl around on all fours and defecate like an animal and growl at each other and just do really bizarre stuff I don't even want to go into in the hopes of bringing out the beast within them. Uh, Satanists the most stripe to this very day are encouraged to do this very kind of thing. And becoming a werewolf is considered the ultimate achievement in that. So, yes, werewolves are real. They're not common, but they're out there. 
And um, don't be afraid of them. I'll tell you one more story. I can tell you this. This is not firsthand, but um, a lady I respect very much told me about this. She said that uh, a couple of deacons in a church in Southern California got to talking to this big biker, Hell's Angel. And you probably know most Hell's Angels are Satanists, you know, duh. Anyway, and that might be the nicest thing that they are. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and they actually led this guy to the Lord. And um, they said, well, you know, with all the stuff you've been into, all the fornicating and adultery and dope and whatever, you know, and, well, I also murdered eight guys. Well, you know, <laughs> maybe you need to, you know, get some deliverance, and then we'll turn you over to the sheriff. So they said, well, we got this little old lady in our church, and she's mighty in the Lord, and she'll help us do deliverance on you. So they took him to this little old lady. He had this little little cottage out in the edge of town. And um, they sat him on the nice little chintz sofa, which kind of creaked under his weight. I mean, this guy was huge. He was like 250 pounds, and it was all muscle. you know. And they said, would you help us? They explained, you know, we led this guy to the Lord, but he's done all this stuff, and we think he needs some deliverance, and then we'll turn him over to the sheriff. And he's perfectly willing to go to the sheriff and get his punishment for all of his crimes, you know. He said, okay, and so the first thing these guys do is they, we command you in the name of Jesus, any demon that's inside of you to manifest. <clears throat> Big no-no. <laughs> Major no-no. Well, anyhow, this guy was, <laughs> you know, and he starts turning into a werewolf, like literally in 60 seconds. He hulks out, and all of a sudden there's this eight-foot werewolf standing in this woman's living room. And these guys just go, ah! And they literally jump out the window. They're so terrified. And this little old 90-pound, 80-year-old lady is sitting there in a rocking chair looking at this giant werewolf, you know, like that. And she goes, Satan, you stop that in the name of Jesus. And, go, and that fast, there's this, like, three-quarters naked giant biker sitting on the sofa again. But he was so freaked out, he ran out the door and was never seen again. That is supposedly a true story. And I just say that to indicate that as bizarre and as scary as these things sound, and as scary as they might appear to be in the movies, it doesn't take a silver bullet to stop a werewolf. It just takes the name which is above every other name. So I don't want to put fear in your heart about this. The only thing I want you to be fearful of is what's going on when our young people start idolizing these things, start having posters of them. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. There's, you can go online now and you can get shower curtains with Edward Cullen, the teenage vampire from Twilight's picture, giant, you know, like this big on your shower curtain. You can get him on your underwear. You can get him anywhere. This guy is the most popular sexy vampire in history. Um... Now, we're going to look at this novel a little bit. It's important to understand that the church, some churches, are using these books with their youth group, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. To me, this is quite bizarre. But you know why? Well, here's two factors. Number one, in the plot line, Bella, who's the heroine of the novel, she's this teenage girl, and I won't tell you the whole plot because it would take too long, but, but essentially she's this only child whose mother has been divorced and she's traveling around with her foot, baseball player new husband, and so she's come to live with her sheriff father in this little town of Forks, Washington, which just happens to be the town that has the most rainfall of any city in America. And believe me, that's on the, there is really a town of Forks. It's now become Vampire Central, by the way, thanks to her books. But anyway, and it, the Olympic Peninsula is a temperate rainforest, so it gets an amazing amount of rain. So anyhow, she meets this guy, and there's chemistry, as they say, Edward, and it turns out he's a 110, 105-year-old vampire, I forget which, but he looks like he's 17, because the stick of vampirism is at whatever age you were turned into a vampire, you're, you're stuck there. Like an interview with a vampire, the two vampires in that story actually turn 
I forget whether she's a six or seven year old girl, into a vampire. And so she's this creepy little seven year old girl that murders people. And at one point she gets so tired of her long hair, she cuts it because she thinks it would make her look older if she had short hair, and it grows back instantly. Because everything when you're a vampire supposedly heals instantly, including your haircut. So anyway, um, they get together, passionately fall in love, but they wait until marriage. So it's pro-chastity. The other thing is, is after they marry, she gets pregnant in this mainly short amount of time. The baby is like growing boom, 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 like this because it's a half vampire, half human baby. And everybody's worried that it's going to be a monster and that it will kill her. And so they want her to abort the baby. And she won't do it. So it's pro-life. And because of those two messages, these things are being pushed in some Christian churches because it promotes chastity before marriage and it promotes pro-life. And I have nothing against chastity. I have nothing against being pro-life, believe me. But, <clears throat> as you'll see, there's a lot wrong with these books. <clears throat> now, parenthetically, before we continue, it's important to note that the lady that wrote these books is named Stephanie Meyer, and she is a devout Mormon. <clears throat> As some of you may know, Mormons are very pro-life. They're very pro-family. Other than believing in having a lot of wives, they're pro-chastity. So, but I'm not doing a talk on Mormonism tonight, so... <coughs> Sorry, save that <coughs> for another night. Well, the fact that they're pro chastity and pro life are excellent biblical values, there's a lot of bad stuff in these books. The Apostle Paul writes against doing or promoting anything evil that good may come of it. That's Romans 3.8. He also tells us in 1 Corinthians 15.33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You've got to realize, these books make becoming a vampire so appealing and compelling. Impressionable teenage girls, which is the primary audience, I mean like 80% of the people who read these books are teenage girls, cannot help but being drawn into this seductive image. Now, here's the deal. Bella is self-described as kind of clumsy, awkward like a lot of teenagers. She doesn't think of herself as being very pretty. Um, and it makes her, because I, I don't want to spoil the books for anybody, but <clears throat> by the fourth book, she's turned into a vampire. And she becomes this graceful, gorgeous woman instead of a clumsy, plain girl. Vampirism promises her that she will live forever, indestructible, young, and beautiful. Now, what young girl wouldn't want that? <clears throat> now, if vampires were just fantasy creatures, this might not seem so alarming. But, contrary to what many Christian thinks, vampires are, to a degree, very, very real. Um... This is not about a young girl fantasizing, oh, I want to be a fairy princess. Because in reality, there aren't fairy princesses. This is about a girl imagining being turned into a real creature of Satan. This is about a girl with this fantasy being able to touch base with vampire internet sites with a couple of clicks of her mouse. Because believe me, I did this the other day. You just hit Google, you type in vampires, like, you know, 500 bazillion vampire sites are out there. Some of them, of course, are about fan fiction and whatnot, but a lot of them are about real people looking to touch base with you, looking to reach out and touch someone <clears throat> with their teeth. Um, now, when I read the books myself, because I did research, I read all four of these books, unfortunately, I could feel myself being drawn into this. Now, mind you, I do have a little <clears throat> history with it, but still, I'm a mature Christian. I mean, I've been saved since 1984. I've been doing deliverance on people since 1988. 
Anyhow, how much more would an adolescent girl be drawn into these things? Because again, they're young, they're impressionable, they don't have a really good sense of who they are, a sense of what their, self, their selfhood might be. That brings us to the next thing. There's some serious emotional concerns over and above the spiritual ones in these novels. <clears throat> Bella is not a good role model in spite of her chastity, in spite of her pro-life uh, stance. For example, once she falls for this Edward guy, it's like he's the center of her universe. She has no life beyond him once she falls for him. He's like a drug to her. It's a kind of idolatry. I mean, she is utterly absorbed with him. At one point, she says he's like the sun around which she revolves. <clears throat> Her family and friends all recede before him. I mean, she lies to her father. She lies to her mother, who are in separate states. I think I kind of explained that. But anyhow, uh, her friends are totally gone, practically. I mean, they're like peripheral once she's got him. Um, also, she's a weak woman <clears throat> with very little ego strength. She thinks nothing of herself which is not uncommon for a child of divorce. Um, but it's not good. And in the second novel, <clears throat> something happens at the beginning of the book. They're having a birthday party for Bella, and she gets a paper cut opening up a present. And one of the members of this family, quote-unquote vampire family that Edward is in, the Cullens, is a fairly, oh, I should explain something. Uh, the, the, the thing that makes these novels more palatable is that all, these, all the, the main vampires in the novel are vegan vampires. What does that mean? Well, that means they refuse to drink human blood. They refuse to kill anybody. <clears throat> they go out and they hunt game. <clears throat> They'll bring down a stag or a deer or a bear or something and eat animal blood. <clears throat> they, they're, they're moral good vampires, so that makes it okay. But this young guy in the Cullen family is fairly new to this abstinence lifestyle, if you will. And so when he smells and sees the blood dripping out from this paper cut, it's like, Argh! and he almost attacks and kills her, just that quick. And so Edward freaks out. He, he thinks at that point that he is not good for her. I mean, duh. So he, he says, I'm leaving you. I'm never going to see you again. I'm getting out of your life. The whole family, we're going to disappear. So just forget about me. <clears throat> and this just destroys her. I mean, she's utterly shattered beyond what is normal, beyond what is healthy. And I, I know, I know. I had Adolescent Psychology 101. I mean, I'm a trained master's level counselor. When you're a teenager, small catastrophes seem enormous. But this is way over the top. I mean, she withdraws into this profound depression. Uh, I mean, she won't see her friends. She just goes to school, does her homework, and stays in bed all the time. I mean, <clears throat> if I were to see her, I would say she was clinically depressed. And she becomes self-destructive because she discovers something. She discovers that if she does something really dangerous, Edward suddenly shimmers around her like a phantom, and she sees him, kind of like an astral vision. And so she does stuff like drive motorcycles really fast, or jump off cliffs, or goes and flirts with a bunch of hoodlums on the street at night, <clears throat> you know, things like that, just to see a glimpse of her missing boyfriend. Now, is that healthy behavior? This is, remember, this is the most popular female heroine right now for teenage girls in the world. <clears throat> Edward also is emotionally abusive and very controlling. Like, but yet, like many abused women, she clings to him, even though he is abusive. He tries to control all her behavior. He isolates her from her family and friends. He is constantly checking up on her, and major creepy, he stands there all night and watches her sleep. Because, you see, vampires don't have to sleep. I should explain that in these novels, a few tweaks are done to the vampire mythos. Uh, Edward does not have to stay out of the sunlight because it will turn him into a crispy critter. 
he has to stay out of the sunlight because if he walks into the sunshine, his skin glitters like diamonds and his true supernatural identity would be revealed. So, see again, there's this attempt being made to make vampires more and more noble, more and more godlike, less and less. Because if you flee the light, then some of that makes you sound evil, doesn't it? <clears throat> and at the end of the second novel, after this long period where Bella is like moping and being depressed and trying to jump off cliffs and whatnot, he himself tries to kill himself. So this is really great. You know, when you think of the high level of suicide rate among our teenagers these days, Bella will do anything for Edward, including lie to her family. <clears throat> uh, her love consists of a deep intensity and burning devotion that should really only belong to the Almighty, not to, not to any human being. And let me just say something. And this is kind of peripheral to this, but in a way it isn't. <clears throat> I'm speaking as someone who was happily married for 36 years to my wife until she passed away last month. But uh, <clears throat> if you are trying to get total fulfillment of your soul out of your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you're out of luck. You're never going to find it. Because there's only one being in the universe that can totally fill your heart. And it's not your honey. It's Yeshua. And even if you're, uh, and even if you're a Christian, and I know many Christians that are single <clears throat> are walking, oh, I've got to find the one woman or the one guy in my life that God wants for me, you know, blah, 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 and then we'll be perfect. And, and No, you won't. There ain't no such thing as a perfect marriage because there ain't no such thing as perfect people. There's not one perfect people on earth, person on earth today. The only one that was perfect was Yeshua. So... My point, I guess, is that, that the fact that she is so all-obsessed and all-encompassed with this guy, you know, it's, it's not healthy. It's not healthy for a teenager. It's not healthy for an adult. Um, she says that literally she is willing to lose her soul to be with him. Now, let me just put this in a more mundane setting. Imagine you have a teenage daughter and you're a parent. And she wants to go out and fornicate with her boyfriend, have premarital sex. And you say, if you do that, that's a serious sin. That's a grave sin in the sight of the Almighty. She says, I don't care, she says. I'd be willing to lose my soul just for one night of heaven with him. That's what this, this same thing is being addressed in these novels, except in a more esoteric way. <clears throat> Let's look at the Cullen family for a moment. They're, the, they're, if, I ain't going to go into a lot of depth on this because I don't have time, but they're this perfect family. He's a doctor, and they're not even a family. None of them are even related, except by the fact that most of them, he, the husband of the family, bit them and turned them all into vampires. But they have no other relationship. But he's got a wife who's the mother of the family, and then they've got, I forget, I think five, five siblings that are all, again, unrelated except by the fact that they're all vampires, and they've chosen to live together and live this vegan vampire lifestyle. And they're all perfectly beautiful. Every single one of them is, is more handsome or more beautiful than the last. They're impossibly beautiful. <clears throat> they're, they're all very restrained. They're very warm. They're very compassionate, with a few minor exceptions here and there. They're like the perfect family. Now, Remember, this lady is a devout Mormon that wrote these books. <clears throat> and what's impossible to avoid doing is contrasting Bella's human family with this perfect vampire family. Remember, Mormons have a bumper sticker. It says, families are forever. They believe the family unit is eternal. That will go on into the eternities, father, mother, and all the children. They will go off and, and become gods and goddesses. And their, their gods and goddess children will have gods and goddess children. They will, they will start planetary systems and have their own planets. And they will be gods and goddesses over these planets and have billions of spirit children. This is Mormon theology, folks. And in a way, <clears throat> the Cullen family is a perfect families are forever family because they're, they're godlike in their perfection. And then compare that to Bella's dysfunctional human family. I mean, her mother is this kind of flaky, 
new agey, you know, ditz of a woman who can't even figure out how to turn on her cell phone half the time. And she's off running around the country with her ball player who's in the minor league's husband. Her father is this nice but emotionally inept guy who's the sheriff of this town, <clears throat> or police chief, whatever, I forget. And, you know, he's well-meaning, but he's kind of a dolt. You know, I mean, if, if I was a father and all this stuff was going on in my house, I'd, I'd think I was the dumbest brain-dead guy around if I didn't see it. But he doesn't see it. <clears throat> so it's not a fair comparison. They're like the Mormon ideal. And this is not, I think, without intention. She's created a, uh, a perfect families are forever paradigm, but she's made it exciting with this little soup song of vegan vampirism. And believe me, she gets a lot of mileage out of this because there's other vampires in the novels that are not so nice. And of course, there's a the vampire werewolf thing, which I won't even go into. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. It's important to realize that the key tension in these books is the fact that Edward fears that if he, because this, this Bella from the end of the first book is just begging him to turn her into a vampire. In the start of the second book, she just turns 18 at a birthday party and she already feels like the clock is ticking, like she's dying minute by minute. She's getting older every second and he's going to be forever young, forever impossibly handsome, and she's getting old. She's going to be this old hag of 19. And so she's begging him to turn her into a vampire. And he won't do it because he and his father, Carlisle Cullen, have these theological questions, which is interesting. They don't know for sure if vampires have souls. And they're afraid that when they are finally destroyed somehow, because there are ways even in these novels to kill a vampire, um, that they may not ever get to heaven. And so he's afraid that if he turns Bella into a vampire, it will cost her her soul. And amazingly, in spite of all this, Bella is willing to get up, give up her soul for love, and that's a direct quote right out of the novel. <clears throat> and the other thing you've got to realize is if you read these novels, there's a lot of what in the TV game they call ust. Ust. Not lust, but ust. Unresolved sexual tension. <laughs> ust. You see it all the time on TV shows. You know, where you've got two characters. The first example it was in an old show, Moonlighting, where you had um, Sybil Shepard and Bruce Willis, I think it was, uh, you know, and they were, are they going to do it? Are they going to do it? Are they going to do it for like five seasons or something? Well, the same thing is going on in these books. There's an enormous amount of sexual tension. And again, these are teenagers who already have raging hormones reading these books. Are they pornographic? Not in the least. But yet there, there's a lot of this just seething right underneath the surface type of stuff. <clears throat> With all these strange dynamics... Is this the sort of literature you really want your young people reading? Is this the kind of stuff you want taught in your Sunday school? They actually have one lady, I forget her name, has actually got a study guide. She's a Christian Sunday school educator, expert. She has a degree in Christian education, and she's written a study guide about how you can take the four um, Twilight novels and use them in Sunday school. Now, and then any wonder why the church is this defanged, toothless, you know, impotent whatever in the face of what the devil's trying to do these days. And these are our young people we're messing with. Brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be. And yes, I say this as a former vampire, <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's like they say, never, never ask an, a recovering alcoholic about what he thinks about booze either, you know. I mean, you'll get a 10-minute tirade. So just think of this as my tirade. The other thing is, as a guy who's been in the counseling, I know how prone teenagers are to suicide. It's the number one cause of death among teenagers in this country. Interestingly enough, guess what the highest state in the union is for teen suicide? Utah. Families are forever country. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that, which I don't have time to go into. But 
Just, just think about that in the light of these books. Okay, I promised you I'd tell about my little encounter with the undead. <clears throat> um, as you probably all know, I was involved with witchcraft, Mormonism, Masonry, Satanism, etc., etc. And as I said earlier, I came to this fork in the road where I could choose to either be a vampire or a werewolf. For reasons that should now be obvious, I chose vampire. So one of my satanic mentors took me down to this very, very strange church in Chicago where I was first exposed to what is called the Nosferatic Current. See, in, in high-level magic, it's believed there's these different currents that flow kind of like different streams within a river. And there's a werewolf current, there's a thalamic current, there's a vampire current. And this was a fountainhead. Because let me tell you, Chicago is a profoundly evil city. Not just because Al Capone used to be there. It was like one of the major satanic nerve centers of America in the 20th century and probably still is today. And so through this, I was introduced to the guy who would eventually bring me into this cult. I was prepared with a bunch of magical exercises, given a strange cocktail of herbs, which I will not discuss because I don't want anybody trying this at home, uh, and lots and lots of vitamin B12, and lots and lots and lots and lots of cocaine. <clears throat> and this was intended to gradually transform me into something other than human. So after a few months of this, um, this being came to our temple. We had a temple in our home up on the north side of Milwaukee. And he drank from my neck. He gashed open his chest. Blood poured out, and I drank from his chest. And then I laid in a coffin that I had specially built. It wasn't just a coffin. You go down to your funeral home and buy a, you know, a garden variety coffin. Casket, I guess they prefer to call uh, It was specially designed measurements down to the millimeter. Certain angles, certain geometries. Like, let me ask you something. Why do you think caskets, the old coffins you used to see like in like westerns or whatever, why are they shaped like that? What are they? They're two trapezoids. One like this and one like this. What is the trapezoid, you might ask? The trapezoid is the key symbol of the Church of Satan. The inner order that I was a member of of the Church of Satan as a second degree warlock was called the Order of the Trapezoid. That's why haunted houses are typically with mansard roofs, like the Adams Family House. Those are called mansard roofs. Perfect place for demons to come in. Trapezoids attract demons. This was a, an alchemical crucible that I would sleep in that would gradually turn me into a vampire. It had magical glyphs all over the inside of it. And oddly enough, it was built out of the same wood that the Ark of the Covenant was built out of. It was lined with silk and satin. Silk is an excellent conductor of electricity. <clears throat> Finally, after three days, I rose from this coffin as a vampire initiate. I was not a full-blown vampire. As I mentioned earlier, that would not happen until I finally died. But I could not drink anything but blood. I could not eat anything but Holy Communion from a Catholic Mass. Fortunately, I was a Roman Catholic priest in the old Roman Rite, so I just said Mass every day. Fortunately, I had a whole bunch of women in my coven, hundreds of them, about seven or eight of which were the high-level women that were more than delighted to let me bite them in the neck. And I, part of the transformation was that my saliva became full of a cocaine-like substance, just like a vampire bat. So I could lick their necks. It would anesthetize them against the pain. Then my fangs would literally grow with arousal from smelling their blood, which I could smell from across the room. And um, I would bite them in the neck, and the, 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 the teeth going into the neck would also introduce some of this powerful cocaine-like substance, so they'd get a huge rush. They said it was better than sex. And uh, they loved it. But I needed more. I needed more and more because blood is worse than heroin. Blood is worse than cocaine. It's the most addictive substance on earth, I believe. And there are many people in the field of addictions that study 
sanguinarian addicts, addicts that are addicted to blood. Not all of them are vampires. Some of them are just nuts. I mean, they're just people that like drinking blood, but they have none of the other trappings of it. They've just grown fond of blood. And what's funny is I just thought of this. I never thought of this before, but when I was in high school, I was such a klutz. I'd get out in physical education, and people would throw me the ball, and I'd get hit in the head with it. You know, I was like the kid no one would ever throw the ball to because they knew I'd drop it or something, or it would drop me. So finally the coach realized I was not getting any exercise standing there, you know, like having people hit me with baseballs. <clears throat> and so he had, hey, why don't you go lift weights? So I actually liked that. So he had, he got me a bench press thing and a barbell and dumbbells and I was lifting weights. And one day I was lifting weights and all of a sudden my gums started bleeding because I had braces. A lot of high school kids did, but I must have strained a little too hard with the weight. And I, I asked the coach, what do I do? My mouth is bleeding. I don't know. He was a PE teacher. He wasn't a doctor. And we, this is a little Catholic school. We had no nurse. And so I walked around the whole day swallowing my own blood. The whole day swallowing blood. And finally I come home, walk in the... T <laughs> and of course all day my teeth are like, you know, full of blood. And <laughs> anyway, um, I come home. I smile at my mother. She goes, ah, what's going on? She called desperately my orthodontist. She says, oh, put a tea bag on it. So she got a Lipton tea bag, slapped it on where it was bleeding, and within like 10 seconds it stopped bleeding. So that, that's a little freebie there if you ever, your gums ever start bleeding. I wonder now if that might have been part of the beginning, the open door. I'll tell you, I could not go out in sunlight. If I did, I'd get like, Serious sunburns, literally within about a minute. I'd have to wear a big, fortunately I still had my Amish hat when I was a druid. Big black brimmed hat. Uh, I couldn't come within 100 feet of garlic. You might say, why is that? Well, garlic is a blood purifier. I'd walk into the health food store and there'd be this big rope of garlic hanging in the corner of the produce section. And I, <laughs> I could literally, it would make my skin itch from like as far away as that banner is. Um, you might ask what was the deal with Holy Communion in the Catholic Church? Well, see the Catholic Church teaches that within the little host and within the chalice of blood is the entire body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. When you take that, you're consuming all the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So I'm getting a whole, whatever it is, nine, is it nine quarts of blood that are in a human body? I forget now. I used to know that by heart, but I haven't had to worry about that in the last 25 years or so. Um, and so it helped. But even so, I kept needing more. I kept needing more. Because like any addiction, you need more and more of the same substance to get the same buzz. An interesting thing happened. This thing about the cocaine in my saliva. I was a Mormon by now. <laughs> Mormon vampire. Yeah, go figure. And <clears throat> I couldn't afford dental insurance that one of my friends in the elders quorum was a fourth year dental student. And he says, I'll work on your teeth for free. I'm top of my class. Don't worry. So I go into, to, and I had a dental work ever since I'd become a vampire. <laughs> this sounds so weird somehow. Anyhow, um, so I sit down in a chair, and he starts, this is before AIDS, so he was working bare finger. They, were, they didn't wear gloves in those days. And all of a sudden, he started dropping his tools. He says, you have the weirdest thick saliva I've ever seen, and my, all my fingers are numb. He says, it's like I just used Novocaine on my fingers. And I go, oops. You know, so he actually did end up wearing rubber gloves to work on my teeth. But fortunately, in my normal <clears throat> unaroused state, my teeth looked perfectly normal. It was only when I got excited that they grew a little. Uh, <clears throat> so I would, I would celebrate Mass every day and say the rosary every day. And then at night, I would go out and work as a newspaper man, putting newspapers in boxes in the middle of the night for the Milwaukee Sentinel. And I'll tell you, it was getting harder and harder for me to not... If I'd see, I'd drive along, I'd see an occasional prostitute or an occasional street person or something out in the wee hours in the morning, not just leap out of the car and rip their throat out. 
because I wasn't getting enough blood. And I was desperate because <clears throat> I love my wife so much. I didn't want to rip her throat out, for one thing, because she was one of the several women I was partaking of. And I was afraid if I ended up killing someone, it would ruin our lives, it would ruin her, it would shatter her, it would destroy our marriage. I'd end up out in a loony bin or like, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer or something. And um, see, Milwaukee produces a lot of weird people. Jeffrey Dahmer isn't the only one. Uh, anyway, so I don't know what to do. And I was getting pretty desperate. I should also mention that we also performed a vampire mass every Friday night at midnight. It was called the Missa Nosferatu, which again, Nosferatu is a Romanian word for undead. And we would actually call upon Vlad Tepes as kind of a dark Christ figure. And we would, we would say the words over a silver chalice and his blood would come into the chalice, literally. In fact, I'll never forget that it was my sister-in-law. We initiated her into the first level of this vampire thing. And at the moment of the words of institution being said, which is like the hocus pocus part of it, you know, um, the chalice burst into flames. <laughs> Just like that. It melted the chalice. She was impressed. I was freaked out. <laughs> so, anyhow, I was getting more and more desperate. And, uh, oh, I, wait, I think I, yeah, that's me during my vampire period. Uh, and I, I was nearly hitting bottom, that I was hitting bottom, because I knew sooner that I was going to kill someone. I thought of the, the cartoon of the um, the two vultures. You may have seen this, where they're sitting on a branch to get in. I'm cleaning this up. He says, patience my foot. I'm going to kill someone. That's how I was feeling. Well, anyhow, at that point is when the part of the story some of you may have already heard started happening. And um, some Satanist girls came up from Chicago to see the great Satanic priest. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, I left out a part. I had sent a check off to the Church of Satan, uh, my $20, year, $20 a year dues. And when it came back from the bank, some lady had written on the check, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus. And at the time, I just sneered. Because I, at that time, I was so far gone, I thought Jesus was the son of Satan. You know, so I just threw the check in the bank and forgot about it, in the vault, and forgot about it. Well, then, these two girls show up at the door from Chicago. They were like satanic groupies, teenage girls, and they wanted to meet me. And so I invited them in and had an audience with them. And they brought these two chick comic books, Spellbound and uh, Angel of Light. And they marked them all up with rude remarks and everything. And one was about the dangers of the occult, and one was about how Satan is the great deceiver. And... He says, you got to read these things. They're so stupid. They're so moronic. You'll love them. You'll get a kick out of them. And I just threw them in the door and forgot about them. See, the, the, the Lord couldn't find, evidently, a Christian that had enough nerve to come and witness to me. I mean, our house was so scary in the neighborhood, we never even had Jehovah's Witnesses come to our door. And you know how bad that is? And, uh, I mean, you know, I can't imagine why the neighbor was scared. We were out there every full moon in the backyard wearing black robes going, Eco, Eco, Azarok, Eco, Eco, Zomalak, you know, all this stuff. You know, I can't imagine why the neighborhood was scared. Might have been the big inverted pentagram we had hanging in the upstairs window. I mean, who knows? Anyway, um, so I forgot about it. But the next day, Mormon missionaries show up at our door. And so we thought this was a sign from God for reasons I don't have time to go into, and we ended up joining the Mormon church. And God used five years in the Mormon church as a spiritual decompression chamber. But I want to say one quick thing. The power of that lady's prayers are this. After about a day or two of feeling awful, from the time I got that check in the mail, I was delivered from my craving for blood addiction and delivered from a craving for cocaine, to which I was majorly addicted. Just like that. And I've never, I don't even, you know, it is, it's never been a concern, either the blood or the cocaine, ever since then. 
and it's been, that was 1981. So it's been, you know, whatever that is. I can't do that math in my head. It's been nearly 20 years. I'm clean and sober. I never went to Narcotics Anonymous meeting either. So there. Anyway, so Jesus ultimately used the LDS church, the Mormon church, to get me to a place where I was reading the Bible, and I finally read Romans 10, 9, and 10, and I read Galatians, you know, I realized Paul could not have been a Mormon. I realized I needed something beside the Mormon church, and I got born again on June 22, 1984. By way of conclusion, <clears throat> I want to say these things. I've been through this stuff. I know this stuff is not fantasy. It is deadly real, and it's deadly serious. But I also need to say that there is no evidence that these vampires are actually immortal. For all I know, they're you know, just weird perverts that like drinking blood. But the demonic power behind these things is not to be denied. Many of the ones you encounter on the internet are very dangerous, may even be criminals. But this none of this makes them any less deadly. Christian parents need to help keep these kind of materials away from our young people, even at the risk of appearing to be not cool. And some parents, that's like the worst thing. Oh, you're not cool, Dad. Well, tough. You ain't reading those God-forsaken books. Remember this, too. James says in his epistle 3.1 that if you're a teacher, you bear a much stronger responsibility than if you're a layperson. And if you're, as a teacher in Sunday school, promulgating these things, you know, that little statement Yeshua said about if you harm one of these little ones, Mark 9.42, it would be better that a millstone would be thrown around your neck and you'd be drowned in the depths of the sea. So we need to take this very seriously because I would hate to be a Christian educator who was using these materials and I found out that a young girl or a young man in my charge had decided to get on the Internet and get involved in vampires because this stuff is, is not good. Realize all of this stuff, vampirism and whatever, is just a pallid counterfeit because Yeshua offers you real eternal life, not shambling around a graveyard all pale and afraid of garlic, but real eternal life in a glorified, resurrected body that has powers that, are, that dwarf anything you've ever read in vampire fiction or vampire fact. So choose him. I chose him in 1984, and I never looked back for a minute. So thank you very much for coming tonight. God bless you.